at the Grange Hall. This is uh, another miraculous winter day with no snow and good parking. Yes. That's the secret to success with our series here. Uh, we will have uh, two more uh, talks in the series. And I'd like to remind you that you can uh, join our association as a member. You don't have to be a Knight descendant. And you can uh, uh, get admission to events like this for free. So, um, without going on at uh, too much length, welcome. Uh, our speaker today is probably familiar to many of you. He's uh, had a, uh, a long career as a history teacher and uh, a, a wonderful, uh, productive life as an author. He's had 11 books, I think. Uh, Something like that. Yeah. Jim, Jim Coogan is a, a wonderful Cape Cod historian, uh, very uh, versatile and uh, inspiring to me in the, the breadth of his uh, knowledge and the uh, excellent way he presents it to the public. Jim Coogan. Thank you, John, and uh, I think that sign we put up on the road about the free coffee and the free cookies, it just really brought them in. <laughs> I think that was really good. Nice to see you all here today, and um, it's so nice and warm in here, and it reminded me of um, years and years ago when probably this, uh, you know, these Grange meetings that were held in the wintertime, I don't think they were as warm as we are today. It's really comfortable in here. And as John said, we're so uh, favored with great weather. Um, I, uh, you know, I just, I just can't believe that we've gone this far without my having to take the shovel out of the garage. I don't want to jinx anything, but, uh, well, anyway, uh, I'm glad to have you here. Uh, this is a, a subject that um, I've written about, uh, essentially the role of women uh, who went to sea in the 19th century. They were the wives of sea captains. And um, sometimes, you know, people will say when I'm being introduced, they'll say, oh, he really knows a lot about women. And uh, I will tell you right away, um, my wife will vouch for the fact that, you know, I'm not an expert in women, and uh, I don't ever pretend to be. Um, the role of women at sea, I do have some knowledge about, and, um, you know, that's one of the interests that I had. But the thing about, you know, being uh, introduced as someone who knows a lot about women reminds me of a story that um, I heard some years ago. It was a fellow named Frank. And Frank um, was a great guy. He did things for his community. I think he was a little league coach, and he, uh, you know, he was a member of his church, very giving to the community, and he was much loved by everyone. And Frank was a motorcycle guy, and uh, he drove his motorcycle across the country to California. And he was just having a wonderful time with his motorcycle, and he was riding up Route 1 through uh, you know, the California coast, and he went around this bend, and um, it was like a cloud that opened up. And it was God that was speaking to Frank. And God said, Frank, he said, you know, you've lived a really good life, he said. And um, I think it's time that I rewarded you. And you can, you can say anything you want, you can have. Because you've really given everything to everybody in your community. And you're a great guy. Well, Frank, of course, he was a little bit stunned by this whole thing. But he thought about it. And then he said, well, God, he said, I love to ride my motorcycle. And he said, and I've ridden it across the country, and I would love to ride it to Hawaii. But there's no bridge, and I would love to see if you would make a bridge from California to Hawaii so I could drive my motorcycle across uh, all the way to the Pacific to get there. Well, God paused for a few minutes. He said, well, well Frank, he said, I can do that. But I'm a little surprised that you asked for something that was for yourself. You know, you usually, you know, are giving of other people. And I would have thought, really, that you would have a more high-minded request, something that would benefit, you know, more people rather than just yourself. So Frank thought about it for a minute. And he said, well, God, he said, how about if you could make it so that men would understand women? Well, there was a pause in the clouds up above. and. God said, Frank, do you want a two-lane bridge or do you want a four-lane bridge? <laughs> well, 
anyway, women at sea is our topic. And uh, here on Cape Cod, uh, you would think and you would be right that um, being a seacoast environment, uh, lots of men went to sea. And I grew up in Brewster, which is called the Sea Captain Town. And when I you know, began teaching history and began thinking about writing about things related to Cape Cod and maritime history, I wanted to write about the sea captains of Cape Cod. You know, it's not a subject that hasn't been touched, but I thought, well, at least I'll break some new ground here with some new sea captains. But as I was researching, and I did a lot of work in um, libraries and archives, you know, my, my goal first was to look at uh, sea captains, and I kept coming across references to women who were at sea. There were letters, there were journals. Uh, this was really a, a real surprise to me because I just never thought that women were aboard ships. I spent four years of active duty, a couple of overseas tours on an aircraft carrier, and as far as I know, we didn't have any women on our ship. And this was years ago. Things are different now. Uh, but, you know, the sailors always said that women were bad luck, you know, and I don't know if that's true because um, if you go back to the ancient Romans, they actually would put the co a coin uh, with the goddess Fortuna uh, under the, the mast, and this, where they'd step the mast, they'd put that coin for good luck, and of course the, um, you know, the, the, um, the ship itself was a feminine creature and the men lived aboard it, but there were a lot of superstitions. But at any rate, going through all these archives, I found, um, you know, a lot of references to women who went to sea and a lot of Cape Cod women. And so I thought, well, this is something. And I started working on this about 20 years ago, and there really wasn't any literature about women at sea, um, maybe one or two books. I brought a couple of books here that have been written since I wrote mine, and um, I think that part of history is being peeled back as it should have been. I think one of the things that, you know, if you remember what you read in high school, um, you may have read Moby Dick, you may have read Two Years Before the Mast. Nothing in the real, uh, related to women at sea. It was a man's world, and certainly we were kind of steeped in that when we re read about it as younger people. Um, but I think now, you know, I think in an effort to really re pull back uh, history so that it includes everyone, we're seeing a lot more social history, which I think is a good thing. Um, where we're seeing you know, minorities, their contribution, and we're seeing a wider picture of what happened really in the past. And I do think, uh, I'd have to admit that um, you know, the reason I think that women just don't show up a lot in historical literature is because most of the books were written by men and they just left the women out. So I felt in working on this book that I did about, it's coming on 15 years ago now that I put it together, but I thought if I could kind of, you know, shed a little bit of life on what life, well, a little bit of light on what life would be like for uh, women who went into really a male environment and how they lived, uh, what they were affected by, I thought it would really add something to maritime history. And I think it has done that. Um, I'm going to do this by showing you slides. And I always, uh, when, I, when I look out in a group and I don't see any teenagers here, uh, I always like to point to this machine because I'm a historian and I use historical things. And this is one of them. And, uh, you know, people say, well, why haven't you gone to that PowerPoint thing? And I, you know, I just don't want to learn it. I've looked at the actuarial tables. I figured I haven't got enough time left in my life to ever master this thing. So I go to the try it, tried and true, and um, generally it works pretty well. So. We'll uh, fire this thing up and um, we'll get it going and uh, we'll just make sure that everything works. All right, we're ready. And let me get a first uh, picture up there. Okay, let's go to the first one here. And um, here we have, looks like a young lady in a rowboat. I like to think it's Cobb's Pond because I grew up very close to Cobb's Pond. It looked a lot like that when I was a kid and we had a rowboat like that. And um, I think the image that is traditional is that women stayed at home and the men went out. They went to the frontier, they went to, you know, the foreign ports, and it was the women who, you know, were kind of in the background. And certainly historically they've been in the background. And I think it's an image that we generally think of when we certainly think of the 19th century, earlier times, there were definite roles that people played, male, female roles. And this woman looks like she's a little bit nervous just being a few feet offshore in this rowboat. 
Of course, you shouldn't be standing up in the rowboat, we know that. But, um, you know, that's kind of an image that is kind of implanted on people, certainly people our age, that, you know, we really were never exposed to the changing roles, males, females, now that we, we see now. Okay, next one, let's see. Women's work, certainly on the Cape, uh, was laborious and, uh, you know, hard. The women were the keeper of the hearth. They had to work, you know, all day long, uh, six days a week, with the exception being the Sabbath. The Sabbath was very important to women because that was the day of church. That was the day in the afternoon. They'd have a chance to socialize with other women. Uh, maybe the one day of the week that they didn't have to be doing something really tough like picking cranberries. You can see this was women's work with a couple of men in the background, but you know, picking on your hands and knees. If you've ever worked a cranberry bog, as I did as a kid, uh, you know that there's two things that are out there that are going to get you. And one of them is poison ivy, and the other is wild raspberry. And when you're uh, messing around in the cranberry bog, uh, those two things you've got to worry about. And these people were down there picking a six-quart measure and uh, working on their knees. Women's work, while the men went out and conquered the seas and conquered the frontiers. That is a reality here when we see, you know, just how hard life was. And I know that when I, just in the morning, when I'm taking a shower and I've got hot water, I think, well, how did these people do this years and years ago? Their life was just something it's hard for us to even imagine. Things we take for granted, um, they just didn't even know about and certainly couldn't take advantage of it. So women's were kind of a tough thing, tough life for these women. You go into our cemeteries that are around here, particularly ones on the north side of the Cape, the older ones, you'd be amazed in the first few feet in the cemetery you'll find women who didn't make it past uh, 19, 20, 21. Childbirth, you know, certainly that was a, a tough one. Uh, and then you look and see some of the little kids and they died, um, you know, months, maybe a year or two of some illness that we don't even worry about anymore. So life was hard for women. Next one. Now, the old idea of the widow's walk, you know, and that's sort of a romantic thing that I think uh, novelists have built up, writers have talked about, you know, the romance of the sea, the, the man was off at sea for a whaling voyage for three or four years, and the wife would go up when she thought his vessel would be coming in, she'd go up on the roof in the widow's walk, and they would spy out onto the harbor to see if they see the ship coming in. That's kind of a romantic notion that I don't think holds a whole lot of uh, water, if I can say that. Um, really, these rooftop uh, enclosures, for the most part, were to put buckets of sand up there, and you'd go up in case of a chimney or roof fire to put the fire out. This thing about the widow's walk is more of a romantic notion than reality. And I think I can show you that because I can show you houses that are two or three miles from the sea and they've got these roof structures on them. So um, a little bit of um, maybe a, you know, a nostalgia buster for you, but um, not really uh, what we used to think they were. Next one. And we mentioned the, um, you know, the figurehead as being part of the feminine part of the ship. Uh, this is kind of a whimsical look of a sailor painting the lips of the figurehead. Uh, I've seen references in some of the uh, journals that I've looked at where uh, the men were very superstitious and if they were in a storm, they would try to talk to the figurehead feeling that the figurehead connected uh, with this feminine sea and might calm the waters. And um, I saw one reference in the New Bedford Whaling Museum uh, archive where the captain said the men are again trying to work their way up in the storm to the figurehead to communicate with that figurehead. So the idea of women at sea, at least in the heads of men, wasn't very far away. You see some of it in the sailors' ditties and little shanties that they always sang about the women that they had left behind. And they also made many implements, particularly of the whaling instruments. We're all familiar with scrimshaw and that sort of thing, that they made for the women that they'd left behind. Okay, next one. And there's a nice close-up of a figurehead. Again, the superstitious sailors, uh, they didn't want to go to sea without some image that connected them in the feminine world to the feminine sea and the feminine ship. We always refer to vessels as she. She is a ship. Next one. These are real women. 
And uh, this picture comes from um, the Woods Hole Historical Society, and two of the women are from West Falmouth, the other four are from Vineyard Haven. The picture was taken in the 1870s in the Hawaiian Islands, where there were a large number of American women who were there, having brought, been brought out there around the Horn to the islands, then their husbands would go north to hunt the bowhead whales and for the most part leave them in the islands. And I always like to look at these old photographs that go back over 100 plus years, 125 years, and I always look at the confidence that are in the faces of these women. They look out at us from another age and they are special women. These are not the women who stayed home and picked cranberries. These aren't the women that were, you know, working around the house and the hearth. These are ones that have gone out to sea, and they are thousands of miles from their home, and that make the, made them part of what writers have called a sisterhood, a sisterhood of the sea. And these were uh, sister sailors, and there's a good six of them right there, two from Cape Cod. Next picture. Um, some of these women went to sea for the first time on their honeymoons. And uh, that's true, I believe, of um, uh, Hannah Rebecca Burgess of Sandwich. Her first voyage uh, was a honeymoon voyage with her husband, Captain William Burgess. Not unusual. Some of them had never been uh, aboard a ship before, and they were headed out either on a whaler or a clipper ship around Cape Horn, out to the Pacific ports, perhaps to whale out in the Pacific for three years or more, uh, away from their, their families, away from their sisters and their mothers and their aunts, away from feminine society. One of the reasons I picked this cover for my book, it comes from a, uh, a print that comes from Harper's Magazine from the 19th century, and it does show uh, a woman who is about to uh, go aboard her husband's boat out to his ship and she's looking wistfully behind her. And what is she looking? She's looking at her <coughs> mother and father, her sisters, her maybe her cousins, the other gals from her community that she's going to leave behind. And in a whaling ship, she's going to be one of one. <coughs> and um, she's going to be isolated. She's going to live in, um, you know, really uh, very unsanitary conditions. Um, it took a very special person to do this. All right, next picture. These are, again, actual pictures. This is a woman from West Dennis. Uh, she was a Kroll, and uh, the Kroll family dominates the Krolls, the house. Uh, they dominate that area of Dennis. And her husband was a, um, I would call him a, a shipper in the sense that he wasn't, he was a merchant man. He wasn't a clipper ship guy, he wasn't a whaler but he hauled a lot of stuff down to South America, particularly to Rio de Janeiro. And she made a number of trips with him on his, his vessel. It was a three-masted ship, good-sized vessel. And I remember one of the comments that she made in her journal, um, she was writing back to her sister in West Dennis, and she said, I love my accommodations on my ship. I have a great window to look out from the back. And she said, one of the best things about being at sea is to clean up I just have to open the windows and throw things out. So she was a person after my heart there, I think. Next picture. But again, this is, um, this is uh, Captain Edward Penniman's wife, uh, Augusta Penniman. And again, when you look at the eyes, you look at the, the confident face as she's looking out at us 140 years ago, um, this is a special woman. She was special in many ways in her own right in that uh, you can see her journal in the National Seashore where they have it, a whaling journal. Uh, she was aboard her husband's ship, the Minerva, sailed out of New Bedford, several four-year voyages. But she was a valued member of the crew in that she was allowed to keep the logbook, which is usually the first mate's job, and she also had a way of inscribing in the logbook some very nice little uh, drawings of the types of whales they took and she would draw this whale, it was a bowhead or a finback or it was a sperm whale, she would draw that and then she'd put the number of barrels of oil that came from that particular whale. So she was a valued member. I've seen some references of Augusta Penniman. Uh, she had a, a way of climbing, not too far up into the rigging, but far enough so that the men who were out in small whaleboats could see 
her putting flags, they were directional flags that would tell the, the people in the small boats which direction the whale pod was heading. And so again, taking an active role in the whaling business was Augusta Penniman. And um, she had quite a life. And you might recognize her house if you're familiar with the Outer Cape and you go into the National Seashore in East Ham. The Penniman House is owned by the National Seashore. It's a lovely place built in the 1870s from the whaling money that her husband and her earned at sea on a number of voyages out in New Bedford. Okay, this is a typical uh, whaling ship. And um, if you've seen the Charles W. Morgan, which is over in Mystic Seaport, uh, you know that it's not a very big ship. It may look big in this picture, but it's probably about 110 feet. Uh, lucky if she's maybe uh, 2,500 uh, tons. And she can handle uh, 30 men uh, aboard very constrained um, accommodations. The captain's cabin was in the aft section. <laughs> I liken it to uh, like a cell, really. I mean, it was like six by eight feet and she occupied it with her husband. The first mate was just across the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the way, and um, the second mate also was in that section of the ship. The crew lived up forward in what's called the forecastle up here, and they didn't generally go to the after portion of the vessel, unless they were engaged in some kind of duty related to the rigging of the ship. But that's a typical whaler right there. Uh, those are the whale boats that are uh, hung on the side that if, in, in, if one of the lookouts sees a whale, they'll drop those down. And there again, for Mrs. Penniman, she would stay aboard, she'd put those flags up, because she could see the direction that the whales were moving from where she was. Next picture. Again, this comes right from the cover of my book, and I think it's just a, a perfect example of a, a kind of a mixed reaction that this young woman has. She wants to be with her husband. And that brings up a point. Some people say, were well, these women progressive feminists of their period? And I don't think so at all. Everything I've ever read about these women, they were very traditional. They wanted to maintain a marriage as best that they could. And if you have a husband that's going off to sea for three to five years, not an easy thing to do. Only the captain's wife was able to have that, um, that privilege, I guess you'd say, to go aboard ship with her husband. But many went reluctantly, and you can understand why. They knew they were leaving mother and father, the rest of the family. They were going with their husband, which uh, was the center of their world, but um, it was a difficult um, endeavor. And they knew other women in their communities that um, had made these voyages and had these experiences. And while the men were used to storms, wrecks, cannibals, whatever else. The women had one other thing at sea. They would have children at sea. And you can imagine, you know, it's difficult enough raising kids, little kids, having a child at sea, but raising little ones, which they did, uh, on a rolling deck. I mean, that was the woman's responsibility. So above and beyond all of the stuff that the men would experience at sea, these women, you know, had their own issues with children and childbirth. The funny story, uh, again, I read about it in a Provincetown journal, and there was a fellow, um, a sea captain, and his wife was aboard, and she was about to have a baby. It was the first child, and um, it wasn't going well. It was, you know, it was just going on and on and on, and he was very frustrated. There was no doctor aboard. It was very typical that the, uh, the captain would be the midwife of his own child. <coughs> and he went up on the deck, and he said, God, he said, if you can present me with a healthy child, I will name that child after the first bird that flies across the deck. Well, wouldn't you know, the next morning, the child was born. He went up, and an albatross flew across the deck. And the girl forever was named Trossy Bangs from Provincetown. But, um, you know, as far as going to sea, you know, for men and women, there was no medical help or anything. As a matter of fact, I think the, the level of medicine in the late 19th century was pretty rudimentary. And uh, they tell a story about just before they'd go out on a voyage, um, the captain would go to some sort of a druggist store or whatever they had then, and he'd say, I'm going to sea for about three years on a whaling voyage. Uh, give me what you got for the men. And so the guy would say, all right, this is bottle number one. If, if the guy's got a black tongue, you give him that. 
Uh, this is bottle number two. If he's got a bad leg, you give him that, you know. He, he had about like ten bottles. He gave him stuff. And uh, by the second year of the voyage, some of those had been emptied. So if he had a bottle that said number six, you know, give for a high fever, and he was out of bottle six, he would just take uh, bottle three and bottle three and dump them together, and you know, that would be the medicine for the guy. So you can understand that between scurvy, bad food, terribly unsanitary conditions, uh, a lot of these guys that went to sea didn't come back. All right, next one. Again, the isolation of the women, um, it can't be emphasized. Uh, if you're one of one on a clipper ship uh, and you're out there for a long time, there were no scheduled port visits really for, for a, um, a whaler. Uh, you might be in the Pacific for several months before maybe they'd have to go into a, an uninhabited island to pick up uh, maybe some fruit or some fresh water. Um, you didn't really see any other women unless you were lucky enough to come across a vessel that was flying a flag that had a, um, you know, a notice that a woman was aboard. But the isolation of the women, if you read their journals, and I, I would say, you know, if, if you look at captain's logs, they're very boring, and uh, you can go through a lot of them. And essentially, they give you the latitude and latitude. Uh, they give you, uh, you know, conditions of the weather, how many miles travel, that's it, you know, and that's their uh, four-hour entry in the log. But women, in their journals, much more expressive, much more real, I would say, because, you know, when you're trying to get a sense of what it's like at sea, the men are really not going to say a whole lot. They're, they're very closed mouth and they keep things close. But a woman, writing in her journal, expressed the feelings. Let's say a, a young fellow fell, falls overboard. Well, the captain in his log is just going to say, you know, Seaman Jones, overboard, latitude such and such, sending his uh, stuff home. But I've seen some journals, particularly uh, in the Peabody Essex Museum, with a lot of women's journals, where you get a real sense of loss that the, the young fellow was gone. In one case, um, a Harwich woman wrote about, you know, she went back and they looked in his uh, locker and she said there were some pictures of people who looked like him who, alas, will see him no more in this world. And I know the men were feeling that, but the women are the ones who expressed it. And so those kinds of journals, the journal of the Daily Record, which is one that was meant to be read by people at home, is pretty, you know, sort of like a travel journal. But if you can get a journal of conscience, and those, I think, really weren't meant to be read by anybody, but they got stuck in a trunk, and then years later, people have come up with them, and I've seen a lot of them. They're very personal. They really say how they feel, um, how they're not always happy aboard ship. Uh, they're bored. They're scared. They're not having a good relationship with their husbands. Uh, this all comes out in the Journal of Conscience. And so as that woman's there looking out at that sea, there's a lot of things going through her mind. There's the loss away from her family, and particularly mother and father back home. Um, there was a, a gal from uh, West Falmouth. Uh, she was the, um, the wife of Captain Samuel Lawrence, Mary Lawrence. And um, she didn't know about the death of her father until about six months after he had died here in Falmouth. And she learned of it from a newspaper that was brought from New Bedford from another ship that came to the Hawaiian Islands where she was. And so, you know, the communications, you know, they, you know, you never, you mail a letter, it might be three, five months before it gets back to where it's going because it has to go into a ship that's going in the right direction. So isolation, really a big issue. Next picture. But if two ships came together and they had women on board, this was a chance to have a GAM, as they called it, G-A-M. A GAM was a chance to get together and talk with another woman. And believe it or not, they took quite great risk in getting to the other ship. Now you might say, well, you know, we can go across, you know, in a little boat, which isn't that easy. You've got to come down the side, get in a little boat and go over. But if you've got some heavy weather and the ships are sailing in parallel course, the next picture will show you what they did. They would get in what's called a gamming chair, which is nothing more than a barrel that's been cut down and they got a seat in it. The woman would get into that, and then she'd be slung across on pulleys to the next ship, which was sailing in parallel course. And then she'd be over on the other ship for five or six hours, you know, talking with another woman. Then she'd go back, sometimes the same way. Um, not an easy thing, but it does tell you the drive that was there 
that women really wanted to talk with other women. And uh, that was a very important thing at sea. And it did break the isolation. A lot of the uh, journals that I see, they were so ecstatic to come across another woman because they may not have seen one for three to four months and you know they wanted to have this uh, feminine connection. I don't know if I would get in one of those if I were gonna have to go over and talk to somebody. I think I'd probably stay aboard. All right, next one. The crew itself was always uh, a bit up for grabs. You never knew who you were gonna get. Um, whaling uh, crews in particular were hard-bitten guys. Um, they had these people called crimpers which would hang around the ports like in New Bedford and they'd get the drunk guys, you know, haul them out of there at midnight and they'd end up on the ship. The next day they'd be 20 miles at sea and they'd say, well, here's your contract right here. You're going to be on this boat for like three months or three years. And uh, they, they, most of these people were running from something because, um, you know, you had opportunities to go out west in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. And I think the lower end of... Um, you know, those that were hanging around the ports and the cities ended up on whaling ships. And you see a lot of references to, uh, you know, tough crew members who, uh, e even mates that were uh, not very civil, and they made it hard for the woman at sea because, uh, you know, they complained. Whalers, for example, if they didn't catch whales, they said, it's the captain's wife, that's why we're not catching them. And the, the wife had to be very careful how she fitted herself into the hierarchy of the ship. You know, the captain was at the top of the pyramid. And then there was a first mate, second mate, third mate, and then you got the bunch of the crewmen down the bottom. Now, she had to fit herself in there. She couldn't obviously become the top of the pyramid, but she had to be careful if she was in the second or third portion of it that she didn't become someone that um, appeared to have too much control over her husband, the captain. Because then the men would refer to the ship as a hen frigate. Now that's not a term of endearment here. And uh, as I say, the superstitious crew, they took it out on the woman because, you know, we didn't catch any whales because we got this woman on board. And a lot of times the women did not like the men to be whaling on the Sabbath, on Sunday. And they'd, she'd want them to, you know, pray and, you know, not do any whaling. And of course the men want to get the whale oil, get back and then get home. And this is one day out of seven that they really weren't happy that they had to sit around and do nothing or read the Bible. Next picture. This is uh, how they would, you know, recruit people from, uh, this was a New Bedford newspaper. Um, it had New York City uh, were recruiting good officers and crew furnished for whalers and merchantmen, good merchants, uh, good uh, mechanics always on hand. You know, you'd see these ads in the paper, but you know, mostly they were just grabbing guys out of the bar rooms and throwing them into these ships because, you know, whaling was a hard and dirty business. I would say that after about 1875, what whaling went on until the end of the century was done mostly by minority crews. They were Cape Verdeans, they were blacks, they, uh, it was a, a way for them to really kind of escape a uh, hard life at land, but not an easy life at sea either. Next picture. The captain was the uh, judge jury of his ship, and I have noticed in some journals that the presence of a woman on board would somehow stay his hand a little bit, and the crew knew it. I saw one reference where a, a seaman wrote in his journal, he said, um, he didn't like the captain, and he said, I would have killed the captain as I would have a kitten, but I didn't want to hurt the old lady. And now that's a case of, you know, he knew that the you know, let's say the typical one was 20 lashes. Well, the captain's wife might say, go easy on him. He's only 16, you know, give him, uh, give him 12, you know. And so they knew that in some cases that, you know, having the woman aboard was a little bit of a, a break for them as a crew. I think the role of women, again, on whaling ships in particular, they had to be really mothers to some of these crew members who were 15 years old their first time away from home. Uh, they had to act as a mother, they had to act as a, a nurse, you know, if something went wrong, they were the ones that kind of took care of it. In many cases, they didn't have really good stewards or cooks, and so they had to do that kind of work as well. It's a hard, hard life. The whaling ships almost kind of divide themselves from the other types of merchant ships. The clipper ships were pretty comfortable, really, uh, certainly after 1870, 
um, I find that the after cabin of a clipper ship was quite well appointed in Victorian furniture and they had um, a coal stove to keep things warm in, in uh, you know, bad latitudes and weather. And they also had a, a schedule. The, the woman knew that in 65 days she'd be in Melbourne. And then after that they would be in Singapore. And after that, they might be at Cape Town. You know, she knew and had some idea where they were going. The whaling voyages, though, just, it's like plowing a field up and back, up and back, every day of the week, every month, until you got whales, because that's the business they were in. Next one. This is the after portion of a clipper ship. And you can see, you know, it's, it's like, a, I think it's like an Airstream trailer, you know. Everything was kind of set up and, you know, very efficiently. Uh, while they were at sea, everything was tied down. All the china was put away and, you know, and, and packed. Uh, everything was uh, bolted to the floor. This would be a cutaway of the clipper ship captain, pretty, uh, cabin. Pretty comfortable back here. Uh, they had heat back here. They had uh, kerosene lamps from hanging from the ceiling. Um, and, of course, the crew never came back here. The other downside, though, for the woman was she was not allowed to go forward of the after portion of the ship, up forward from the, the, main, the main mast and forward to the foremast uh, was crew, crew, crew area, and you didn't interact with, um, with them, and they didn't interact with you. So, essentially, her world was quite small, but on a clipper ship, it was more comfortable. Once in port, then you start unpacking everything and you have to entertain the uh, diplomatic corps that might be in that uh, port. You might be entertaining your brother-in-law and his ship. He comes over with his crew and, you know, there was a lot of that. We find a lot of the Cape Cod captains were popular and knowledgeable about all the major ports of the world from the Civil War period up to the end of, the, end of that century. Next one. This is just a picture. It comes out of the stern of the uh, Charles W. Morgan, you know, big long um, place to sit here, like a, a couch. Uh, things built in for uh, record keeping. Probably a big table in front here, and then the um, the passageway up to the main deck above the after cabin. Next one. By, by the uh, we're looking at you know, 1890 here now. This is a very Victorian cabin aboard a ship. The captain is, uh, you know, making some notes. She's reading a book. You've got a coal stove here. Very heavy furnishings and certainly typical of that period. Um, architecture on land and architecture on the ship's cabin. Next one. I love this picture because this is a picture of uh, Anna Hallett. Anna Hallett was the wife of Captain Banks Hallett. He was a Yarmouth merchant captain. He was in the China trade, and um, he took Anna uh, with him on a voyage out to China. And before Hong Kong really became the center, he had to go up the Pearl <coughs> River to Canton, which was where the Westerners did their trading. And one of the first things that a captain would do, he'd go ashore, he'd do his business, but he would always find a Chinese artist, and he would have a picture of his ship painted, and then he would have a picture of himself painted, and he would then have a picture of his wife painted. And um, the thing about it was, he could go ashore because that was allowed. The woman could not leave the ship. So here he was, Captain Banks Hallett. He's ashore, and he's got a picture, you know, the fella can see his ship out there, the Chinese artist, so he can paint it. And he's there, he can pose. But when the Chinese artist said, well, what does your wife look like? Well, it's almost like, you know, if a man goes into any kind of a store to buy clothing for his wife, I don't recommend that, and uh, it, never come, it never turns out well. Uh, you know, she's there, you know, and he was trying to describe her, and he described his wife, Anna Hallett, to the Chinese artist, and that picture was painted. And um, the next picture will show you what Anna Hallett looked like. <laughs> and I, I often think when I get out of the historical society in Yarmouth, that, you know, what, was on Cap, what was on Captain Hallett's mind? And how, how did Anna take this picture? But at any rate, um, it hung in the, uh, in the Banks Hallett house for a long time, but I always got a big kick out of it. And so a lot of the pictures that you see uh, that are in museums, nicely done of ships, they're done by Chinese artists, and it was done in that method, you know, the fellow would go ashore. 
Next picture. This is a gal from East Dennis. Her name was Persis Kroll Addy. She married Captain John Addy, who was a clipper ship captain. He sailed one of the, uh, the five clipper ships that were built in the Seward Harbor by the Shiverick family between about 1840 and 1865. And this was her picture. And um, she married Captain Addy and went on her first voyage out to the Pacific. They hit all the ports. They went to Rangoon. They went to Shanghai. Oh, they went uh, to Melbourne. And they traded there. And on the way back, um, they were traveling uh, near the, somewhere in the, the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. And they got into a shipwreck. Now, this was her first voyage. And next picture. They were wrecked on um, the island of, right near the island of Samoa. And the uh, ship, I think, was the Christopher Hall. She was a good-sized vessel, uh, one of the pride of the Shiverick fleet. It was totally torn apart. Next picture. And she survived on this desert island for about three months until um, some Westerners that uh, were on another island nearby, I think Apia, uh, the island or the capital of Samoa, and they came over and rescued her. And she... Uh, she wrote in her journal about how basically she was reduced to a native, you know, because they, when they left the ship, all they had was what they were wearing. And she said, my stuff wore out. I had to go native with a grass skirt. And, you know, you can imagine a Victorian woman that had to live like this. And among, there were some people on the island that actually took good care of her, native people. But um, she was very upset that she had lost all of the things that she had purchased in the China ports to bring back for gifts for the people in East Dennis. And eventually her husband, who was quite badly hurt when the ship went aground, he never went to sea again because uh, he just couldn't because he was uh, physically unable. And he died quite young after that. The first time the people back home uh, heard about this was about <coughs> six months later. This was from the uh, Yarmouth Register, and they mentioned that ship, the Christopher Hall, uh, wrecked on the Navigator Islands, uh, Howlands Island, November 24th. Uh, they were carrying... Uh, uh, dung from the birds. 648 tons built in Dennis in 1857. So 10 years out, that ship went. Captain Eddy never went back to sea. And Persis uh, came home and never went to sea again herself. Next picture. This is uh, a woman from Provincetown. Uh, her name is Clara Cook. And the Cook name is a, a prominent name in Provincetown. And she went to, sh to sea on a whaling ship in 1857 out of Provincetown. They whaled along the west coast of Africa and down around Cape Horn into the Indian Ocean. She was gone from Provincetown for about three years. Next picture. Um, as I say, they were whalers. And as I read her journal, which is a very uh, detailed journal that is in the Provincetown, um, the Pilgrim Memorial Museum there. I happened to get access to it some years ago. She actually wrote down something every day, even if it was just the weather. But uh, she talked about catching the whales. And uh, there was one thing that she wrote, and I don't think I'll look for the quote, but basically it was she felt sorry for the whale. And she felt sorry because they had captured a whale with its calf, and they killed the calf right away. And the mother whale continued to circle, and then the men from her uh, husband's ship, the N.D. Chase, they speared the whale, and um, she said, uh, I could hear what was happening from where I was. And she said, who would blame the whale for fighting hard to save its life and its child? And I thought that was quite interesting and insightful and really typical of how a woman might look at this in that a man just wants to kill the thing and get rid of it. But this woman could actually transfer her own feelings, perhaps of motherhood, toward this whale. And uh, even though she was glad that they captured it so that they could get home with the whale oil, she had that feeling and put it in her journal. And I thought that was really, it was insightful to me because I think a man would have never done that. Next picture. And one of the, she had just her little uh, son, she had two boys on board with her. The older one was about six and he was up in the rigging running all around with the crew and she wasn't, you know, going to restrict him, but she had this little, he was less than a year old, she called him Bub, and uh, she mentions a lot about taking care of the child on the ship, particularly Bub. The older one, 
he was kind of under the control of one of the mates, and, and they were teaching him the ropes and all the rest of the stuff. But little Bub, um, you know, he's all what a little baby would be, but at sea, and you know, becoming seasick, having colic, and you know, all the rest. Next picture. And um, one of the things that, you know, the whale product was the corset stay. The corset stay, which is part of uh, probably the baleen that comes out of the whale's mouth, that was used to keep, uh, you know, the corset nice and stiff. And so a woman has an awful lot to thank a whale for. That was an advertisement in a New Bedford newspaper. Next picture. The whale ship itself was pretty unique. Um, they were bark rigged, usually three, uh, three masts. They could be schooner rigged as well, but uh, usually a very wide beam. And the wide beam was to accommodate a lot of whale oil barrels down below. They were not smooth runners, um, unlike a, a vessel like a clipper ship that can cleave the, whales, the, the waves nicely. These things rolled up and down. And so seasickness was a constant. You can imagine, you know, the smell of the whale oil and the, you know, the blubber. It was a mammal that they were chopping up, so you got blood all over the decks. Uh, when they tried out the, uh, the blubber, trying it out, meaning boiling it up, all this um, dark smoke came up, and it got all over the crew. The crew was a greasy thing, and it went into the sail, so your, your thoughts of a white-sailed ship, a whaling ship, was not going to be the way it was. No ship at sea passed downwind of a whale ship. They, they smelled bad. Uh, it was really tough duty. Next picture. This will kind of show. They got a sperm whale here. Uh, he's in on the side of the, um, the ship. They got outriggers here. And these men are going to cut this whale into strips so that they can rig a block and tackle and haul up his blubber on the side. And this guy is out there making a uh, rig around the outside. Now, mind you, you're attracting a lot of sharks in this area. This is kind of dangerous work if you're out there. But he's there, and that whale will be cut up. Next picture. Um, there's the, uh, the whale being stripped after having been cut. They bring it up on the deck. Next picture. And then you've got this cutting process where they're going to strip this thing into a whole lot of pieces that are manageable that can go into these huge boiling uh, pots, tripods that are on the main deck. And they're going to boil them up. That smoke's going to come up. It's going to be very dirty. So, you know, maybe men can deal with a lot of dirt, and uh, they don't mind living like a slob for a while. But it's very difficult for women, certainly, you know, uh, to live in this kind of a condition. Um, it was just very, very, very hard and whaling. Let's go next one. This is uh, Mary. Um, well, let's see. Um, Mary Lawrence. Now she's the West, the West Falmouth wife, uh, wife of Captain Samuel Lawrence. She's kept probably the best journal that I've read in terms of its thoroughness. 1850 to 1854, she was aboard the ship Addison, which came out of New Bedford. They did the whole Pacific route as well as the North Sea. They went, they went fur up and in, up into the Bering Sea and uh, to hunt the bowhead whales up there. And she went with her husband. A lot of the women stayed in the Hawaiian Islands. She went. And her journal was very, very detailed. Uh, she had her little daughter with her, little Minnie. Minnie was about six. And so that gave her some companionship. And, and she really appreciated that. And um, her journal, as I say, is probably the most detailed of any of the women's journals that I've read. It is published. I think it was published by the University of Rhode Island. So you can get it. Next picture. This is Captain Samuel Lawrence. He was one of four brothers from West Falmouth who were all whalers. And uh, their families, uh, women, all went to sea with their husbands, the, the Lawrence family. And, uh, you know, a big part of Falmouth's history. If you think about whaling, you want to think for Cape Cod, Falmouth, Provincetown, pretty much that's it. You know, those were whaling ports. Falmouth built whaling ships. Provincetown had some that were built elsewhere, but you know, Provincetown was the second most important whaling port after New Bedford. Once Nantucket uh, couldn't handle the ships in their shallow harbor, and that was about 1850. After that, New Bedford number one, Provincetown number two. Next picture. And again, this is a, uh, a whaling bark. She's uh, got two square rigs up here. 
and then a schooner rig on the uh, the aft or the mizzen sail was here, and then there's your uh, whaleboat in the davits. These are not cannons, but they did paint the ships this way to scare the natives in the Pacific because they wanted the natives to think that these were armed with cannons to scare them off, but they were only painted that way. Um, there were no cannons aboard. Next one. And this is the uh, area of the Arctic Ocean. A lot of whalers left the Hawaiian Islands in the warmer months and sailed up past, uh, the, you know, into uh, Point Barrow up this way and up north of what is now the Yukon Territory and they whaled in the open area that hadn't frozen in the summertime and then they would try to get back before they got frozen in and they had to be back through this narrow opening to go south by September 1st and we have a lot of examples of whale ships being actually frozen up there they didn't make it and the ice shifted and they were blocked next picture um, this is a picture of whaling in the Arctic with probably some French ships as well as um, English ships and American whalers. They've got a whale in here and sometimes it'd be 17, 18, 20 ships uh, in a very narrow area of the uh, Bering Sea which was ice free and uh, that meant a lot of competition and anger as to like, who would get a harpoon in and you know, maybe the whale would uh, sound, come up somewhere else. Another ship would get a harpoon in. They'd fight over who had it first. Next picture. This is a little mini. Uh, this was Mary Lawrence's uh, <coughs> child. She's got a, got a dressed up a little bit like an islander. But there was a story where uh, Mary Lawrence was a religious woman, and she didn't like the men swearing, and she really wanted them to be in services on Sunday, and she really wanted them to read the Bible. And they, they weren't really too keen on it. And she tried to give them Bibles, and they wouldn't take them. But what she did do is little Minnie had a little doll, and Minnie had a doll carriage. And so uh, Mary Lawrence put all the Bibles in the doll carriage, and Minnie could go forward up into the cruise area, because she was just six years old. And a lot of the crew members had either their own children or they had sisters, and they took to uh, little Minnie, and they took the Bibles. And so she felt very good about that and wrote about it in a journal about how she'd outwitted those sailors by, you know, having her daughter give them the Bibles. I think probably they got tossed overboard as soon as Minnie went back to the <laughs> aft cabin. But, um, Minnie was a great companion to, um, to her mother on that four-year voyage. Next picture. And I often think, too, that, you know, if you went to sea and you were a woman and you were in a whole world of men, you'd sort of give it up. You know, you'd say, I'm not going to be feminine anymore. I'm just going to be what I am. And I'm going to just do what I want. But I didn't think, you know, from this example, Mary Lawrence, she was um, not one that was going to give up her femininity in any way, even if she was in tough straits. After four years at sea, the Addison came up the Acushnet River into New Bedford, and a boat came to take her off, but she had realized, uh, either by getting a local newspaper, that the styles of clothing had changed dramatically in the four years that she was away. And she refused to leave the ship. And her family was waiting at a hotel in New Bedford. They hadn't seen her for four years. She wanted to see them. But it wasn't until after dark that the small boat went out to the Addison, took her into one of the finest uh, stores in New Bedford to get outfitted in the proper outfit. And then only did she go meet her family after four years. So I think here you've got an example of uh, maybe how she was dressed when she saw them for the first time. Next one. This is an interesting person. This is Viola Cook, another Provincetown woman. And next picture, um, she married uh, Captain John Atkins Cook, who was a real hard driver. He liked whaling in the Arctic, and he liked whaling above the Yukon River. And his plan was he didn't want to go south when it was getting to September. He wanted to stay up there for the winter so that when June came, he'd be the first one there to catch the whales. So he and a couple of other ships, uh, stayed right in the, uh, the entrance to the uh, Yukon River and they froze themselves in. They had plenty of wood and a big wood stone so they could keep themselves warm. Next picture. But Viola was there. This is the area, this is the Yukon Territory, the Yukon River here. There were two anchorages, Bailey Island and Herschel Island, where the um, Arctic whalers would go. Now, when Viola Cook first started going up there about 1890, there were about seven or eight 
American ships there with families and other women. It wasn't too bad hanging out there for the winter, even though in November the, the daylight goes away pretty much and it doesn't come back at the end of February and it's like 50 below zero. But they had a little, uh, like a, well, I'd call it like a building like this where they would gather and they had dances and dinners and all that sort of thing. And it wasn't too bad the first couple of years that she was up there. But, you know, after two years, she wanted to come back. She had a daughter that she left in Provincetown, and she wanted to see the daughter. But the captain says, no, we haven't got enough oil. We're staying. And so they stayed a third year. They did get some whales in. They were going to come back, and they got frozen in. Couldn't come back through the area of Point Barrow. So they were stuck up there for a fourth year. Well, by this time, Viola was going a little uh, nutty. And... Um, she, and the other whalers had pretty much left, so she's up there, you know, it's dark, it's cold, and um, she came back to Provincetown, finally, um, and um, Eugene O'Neill, the great writer, was in Provincetown in this period, about 1910, and he heard the story of uh, Viola, and Viola had actually probably gone into a deep depression, as anyone would in that circumstance, and uh, they say the husband and uh, night he would sleep in a different room and he had things over the door, like big bureaus so that she couldn't get them. And he wrote a play, Eugene O'Neill wrote a play, which he uh, called I-L-E, Isle. Now, Isle was the corrupted word that the sailors would call the oil. And it featured a crazy woman in her cabin on the darkened ship, playing the piano constantly, and her husband, you know, barricaded in his own room, afraid that she would kill him. And that became a play, one of the early plays at Eugene O'Neill, based on the life of Viola Cook. Next picture. This is another picture of the whaling ship um, in the ice, frozen in. Next picture. Um, a whole winter from uh, really, you know, you're not going to get any daylight from November to the end of February. Dark, cold. Next picture. These are the natives that came around to sell them reindeer meat and the other stuff, you know. And this was the uh, this was the neighborhood there where Viola was for four years. Next picture. And there they are with a dog sled. They'd go out, you know, and hunt and bring back seals and other things. Next picture. This is I like this one. This is Viola in her summer outfit. <laughs> Next picture. Well, we're getting near the end, and one of the things that I find interesting is just how many records are out there that I've never seen before that show women getting their children baptized in other places or recorded in foreign courts. And uh, this is an example. This one was taken in Montevideo, uh, Uruguay, and this woman was recording the birth of her child and her own self uh, as being there uh, for record-keeping purposes. Next picture. The last person, actually next to the last person I want to talk about is this little gal here. Um, she is a Harwich girl and she was um, with her family. They sailed around the world and they ended up almost starving to death. They ran out of food and they had, I think, two chickens on board. And the only way they could get them to lay is that they took all the buttons off of the people's clothes and crushed them up so that, you know, they, you know the chickens would lay off of those buttons. And she wrote a little story about being a girl. She was only about six years old when she went, and her work is in the uh, Harwich Historical Society. Next picture. This one is one of my favorites, a little girl from East Dennis. Her name was uh, Louisa Sears. Her, her father was Captain John Sears, Joshua Sears, and he had a clipper ship. And um, he came back from Boston one day, and he said to his wife, Minerva, we're going to sea on my new ship, the Webfoot. And, um, we're all going together. And he'd been on a voyage years before, and he missed his family. And he figured everybody would be happy about that. But little Louisa ran upstairs crying. So he went up and he said, what's the problem? And she said, well, you just gave me my pony about six months ago. And I'm training the pony, and I'll have to leave him and be gone for a long time. Well, Captain Joshua, a good man, he a uh, good father, too, he said, listen, here's what we'll do. I'll build a little cabin onto the aft cabin. You can bring the pony on the ship. <laughs> And you have to promise that you'll exercise the pony every day. And she did. They put special shoes on the pony so it wouldn't slip. 
And that pony rode all around the world and came back to East Denison, probably a nice life in the pasture there. But I always think of what a nice man he was to do that for little Lulu Sears. Next picture. If you're raising kids on a ship, one of the rules they said is don't let the kid name the, the animals on the ship because little Ju Juba the pig will end up as bacon some morning and you'll have to explain that. So the women all mention, you know, don't let the kids get too close to the animals. Next picture. This is uh, the Hamlin family, Bertha Hamlin. She became later a librarian of the East Falmouth Library, but she went to sea with her father, her mother, and her brother, and they sailed all around the world. And by age 10, she spoke three languages and had seen the entire world, and then she retired and lived in East Falmouth for the rest of her life. Next picture. I found this grave over in Percasset, and it was really kind of a reminder of the difficult situation of children at sea, especially babies. This little child, Edward, died just over, a little over a month after he was, um, after he was born, and he was, um, they brought him back, which wasn't unusual. They brought him back, they put him in a cask of alcohol, they brought his body back, and buried him next to the family, in the family plot. He's next to his mother and father in the Fulcastic Cemetery. I had a hard time finding it, actually. It was kind of overgrown, and it was a small little stone. I made a rubbing of it. But it does tell you that, you know, raising the kids, we raised our own kids in the backyard, you know how tough it is. Imagine if you had them on board. Because they're falling overboard, they're getting sick. Next one. And shipwrecks and uh, pirates, all of that sort of thing were dangers that these women endured. Next one. Next one after that. And finally, we get to our, our sandwich woman, our final woman. And this is Hannah Rebecca Crowell Burgess. And she was a Crowell from Sandwich. She married a Brewster captain, Captain William Burgess, sailed out to China, first voyage, very successful, came back with a lot of stuff, and some of it's in the uh, glass museum. But the second voyage out, our husband got sick after passing Cape, uh, Cape Horn, and he went into a coma. Now, the story has always been that, you know, she had been a school teacher or knew enough mathematics to do navigation, and so she took over the navigation of the ship because the first mate apparently wasn't sure of his figures, and she guided the ship 600 miles to uh, one of the ports on the, on, in Chile. And her husband, William Burgess died. And so she brought his body back. Later, they're buried in the Sagamore Cemetery, uh, just over the Sandwich Line. And that's a story that's connected to our history here in Sandwich. And it's interesting that um, a woman came through here maybe five years ago, and she had a grant. She was working at the, uh, the, the museum, and she's going through the records. And she really kind of debunked the story of um, Hannah Burgess, saying that you know, there's no proof that the mate turned over his navigation to her. It's a story that she said, and she claimed it was, you know, the author, the new author, who claimed it was made up, and that essentially she became a professional widow for the rest of her life, and never really wanted to do anything else. So it brought something to me, thinking that, you know, when you're looking at records, a lot of different people can interpret them different ways. I still like to think that Anna Rebecca Burgess did navigate that ship, and she is a heroine that belongs in our town's history. But again, there are people who will challenge it now. Next one. Just a couple more here. Um, that was the ship, which I think was the Challenger, um, that she sailed on the second voyage and brought it into the port in Chile. Next picture. And today you can see these things in the museum. The Bible is particularly interesting because when she came back with her husband's body, she had a steward that took good care of her, and she appreciated it very much. When she got back to Boston, she gave him her Bible and inscribed it to him, you know, thank you very much for taking care of me. Well, later, some years later, that steward was on another ship, and his ship was wrecked at Formosa, which is Taiwan. And um, in picking over the wreckage, some people found the Bible, and eventually it got back to Massachusetts, and uh, a Boston newspaper advertised it, saying, this Bible has been found, it's inscribed such and such. She recognized it, and she was able to reclaim the Bible after a number of years having it gone out that way. That's not a great picture, but you got a daguerreotype of her and Captain Burgess, and a shoe from China that she brought back. So, next picture, I think we're almost at the end. Yeah, we are. 
And uh, I just want to let you know that this is an area of, of maritime history that hasn't had a lot of investigation. I do have some books up here um, that have come out and kind of opened that subject up. But there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot more journals that need to be analyzed. I wanted to just concentrate on Cape Cod women, but women from the ports in Maine all the way down to Long Island, there were literally hundreds of them that went to sea with their husbands well into the beginning of the 20th century. And so uh, it's a story that I'm glad you came to hear, and I hope that if you're interested in it, you'll start checking that genre in libraries, and you might start with any one of those four books there. Uh, this one I particularly like, and if I could have met Joan Druitt, who wrote it, she's written several books about uh, wives at sea, but Petticoat Whalers, you can't forget that name. <laughs> so if you're in a library, you want that sort of a subject, that's one to start with. She's got a great bibliography in the back, too, that can help you. So I went a little further than I thought I was going to go, but it was such a nice day, I figured I would. If there are questions, or you can make a run for the cookies, whatever else. Yes? Two, two quick questions. The, the ships that I up up in uh, Alaska, off Alaska, in the Strait there, were they copper-clad like um, uh, the Endeavor was? I would assume, I would assume they were, okay. uh, because this was between 1890 and 1910. By then, most all ships were clad uh, with copper, and that was certainly for warmer water, because of those boilers that are in the water that were blow in the ship. But I think just for stability. And these ships that went north up to whale up there were reinforced hulls as well. So they were built for it, but sometimes, you know, even that, they would be overcome. The children that were born at sea, what national origin did they assume when they were, let's say, born in a foreign land? Well, you know, they were did American children. Certainly they were born on the ship. The ship bore an American flag. It was an American child. But what's interesting is, you find children that were born at sea, a lot of them had the middle name Seaborn, or they had a middle name Woodhull, or they had a middle name of an island that they were perhaps anchored near. Um, and so I've seen that. Another thing, too, and if you want to do a PhD pro project for this, which I don't want to do, but um, I found that the, the daughters of sea captains they were at sea in the 1850s and 1860s, and they were being bred for a society where the captains, the maritime captains, were the top of the social pole, the economic pole. It was a class of people that they were being bred to marry into. But then, after the Civil War, if you see what happened in the Civil War, most of our fleets were decimated by the Confederate raiders and sold to foreign interests. The American maritime industry went down completely after 1870. The development of the screw propeller, uh, which was married with the steam engine, took away the sailing vessels, and so you know ships were not operating the same way. A whole class of people ended. The sea captains, people were going west, and young people were not going to sea. So a lot of these young girls who matured around 1870, they were 19, 20 years old, looking for sea captain husbands, never found them. And I've looked at a lot of the, the women, the girls particularly, that were born in the 1850 to 1870 period. Many of them lived their entire lives without ever marrying. I thought about that. I thought, well, gee, you know, if a woman, let's say she was well-educated, <coughs> came back here to Cape Cod, looking for a husband, who's here? Clam diggers, primary pickers, farmers. This is a woman that probably speaks three languages, has seen the entire world. Um, is she going to really want to you know, live with this guy that, you know, he probably had a left sandwich and he doesn't have much to say? So I think that, you know, I think a lot of them, that whole class that they were bred to enter was wiped out by 1880, 1890. And I think I might explain it. Again, this is a PhD thesis if you want to go work on it. I'm not going to do it. Well, thanks so much.